Hey there, folks. My name is Cam Day. I am the founder and creator of Daylight Publications, and it is a huge honor to get to speak to you guys all here at our online setting. A uh, huge thank you to EGX for inviting me and letting me be part of uh, this awesome, awesome uh, opportunity to come and talk to you guys about RPG Publishing. So uh, I just wanted to give you guys an overview of what the panel will look like. Uh, so start with, what do you need to get started? What are some things you need to get started to get to work in the RPG industry? You will occasionally hear my cat and have guest appearances by her as well. So that's gonna be the first part of how do you get, like where, where do you get started? Then the next part's gonna be writing your first projects. Uh, for the point of this uh, whole thing, we're gonna be starting on the DMs Guild where I got my start, the Dungeon Masters Guild, and I'll sort of tell you guys a little bit about that. And uh, so from there, then we'll go to actually publishing your first piece. Now you've published it. What do you do? How do you get it published? That kind of thing. Then from there, keeping things going and keeping things rolling. So sort of how do you keep the steam and keep publishing? Then how to take that small, that indie scale creating to the next level and build it as, you know, going into Kickstars, which is what I did. So that is kind of what we are looking at. That's kind of what we are doing. So we're going to have our introduction, then a break, and then we'll get into the next part. So let me get my presentation up and running here. All right. So let me share my screen with you folks. And there we go. So from Guild to Kickstarter, a beginner's guide to entering the world of role-playing game publication. That is what we have got here for you guys. So who am I? Who is this person you are talking to? My name is Cam Day, he, him. I was born and raised in the mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm a full-time secondary history teacher. I teach fifth through 12th grade, focusing more on high school, collector of comic books, forever DM, and the founder and creator of Daylight Publications. So that's who I am. What is Daylight Publications? You will see my uh, logo there made by the amazing Rose Elysium on Twitter. We were founded in October of 2019. Uh, my first book was Voice of the Gods, A Descent into a Vernus Tie-In. It had four subclasses as well as a glyph system based on a Nokian. Uh, from there, I went on to produce books like Root and Twig, which is a collection of uh, tree, timber-themed subclasses and an original class, and Forged, my homage to Bionicle, Bionicle and Eberron. In the spring of 2020, uh, we decided to produce our first Kickstarter, Supers and Sorcery, which is now an Electrum bestseller on Drive Through RPG. We have 355 sales of <laughs> Uh, supers and sorcery. When I went into building comments or building daylight publications, I went in with sort of these five ideas. Our company philosophy, historical inspiration. A lot of my projects they draw from mythology, history, events that have happened. Being a history teacher, it's kind of an occupational hazard. Comedic value. I want things to be funny. I want people to have fun with them. I want them to be epic and outstanding and slapstick and just crazy. That ties into highfalutin action. Rule the cool in all my games. Rule the cool, rule of excitement. What works best cinematically? Role play first and mechanics second. A lot of my stuff is overpowered. A lot of stuff I produce is zany. It's out there. It's not the regular norm for D&D. That's how I work. That is how my company works. That what I, that's what I support in all my writing projects. And that's what I push for. Because at the end of the day, d d is about creating a story. Any role-playing game is about building a story, and that's what should come first. So, getting started. I should get started. Get onto the socials. Getting on social media, which we all mostly are nowadays, is going to be an amazing first step for you to take. It gets your name out there. It's an incredibly huge step to get your name out there. And it co it's connecting to see what other people are doing. What are other folks doing? How did other folks get into the hobby? You know, who can you connect with? Who can you build with? Social media is a massive resource. You can connect with writers, artists, uh, creators, editors, layout and graphic designers. You have this huge spot, this huge area that you can take advantage of, and social media is there. 
and it helps you develop your marketing and networking skills. So the two social medias you'll see here that I have, Twitter and Discord, pretty, pretty common. Facebook is starting to kind of die out. Uh, I would say that most RPG stuff, most RPG creation, really active on Twitter, really active on Discord. Facebook's kind of middling. Um, other social media platforms, not so much. I don't think I've heard of there being an RPG uh, Snapchat. Uh, TikTok is definitely becoming very big, uh, more so for just like D&D fans. So if you make the migration from TikTok to Twitter, you'll be able to build those connections there. So get on social media. I know some folks might not like it, but it's a huge first step. What is your brand and logo? This kind of connects with what we're going to talk about in step number three for getting started. What do you want your logo and brand to be? You know, what is the first thing people think when they look at your logo? What is the story that your logo tells? This is really important, especially to marketing, because if you don't do that, folks aren't going to recognize you. They're not going to see your book and say, ah, I know that so-and-so's book. I know... When folks see my logo on my books, they know, yep, mm -hmm, that, that's something Cam did, or that's one of Cam's projects, or that's one of Cam's teams. They know what they're going to get when they see my logo. So, for example, our logo is a copper dragon. Copper dragons are jokesters and storytellers. So, folks know my products are for laughter and narrative. That's what I'm talking about. That instant recognizable. We all know what different logos stand for. I'm not going to get into the, you know, the meat and potatoes of it because it's pretty basic stuff. We think about it. For example, World of Warcraft. When anyone looks at the WoW logo, they know, most people know, yep, we know something from that. So think about that. What is your brand and logo? What is your niche? What is your niche? Niches are fun. Niches can be super helpful, and that helps you find your people. When you're getting ready to start publishing, think of what you like. Think of, okay, this is what I do in my home games, or this is what I do here, this is what I do there. That can help you build a base to develop from. So what is your speciality when it comes to creating, when it comes to playing or writing or DMing? Subclasses, magic, feats, races, optional rules, conversions from older editions. Adventures, monsters. What is your niche? What is your niche? If you figure that out, then it's going to make things a lot easier. Join online writing opportunities. Say you're nervous about getting started on your own. Like, I don't know if I could start like right off the bat on my own. That's when you look for groups where you can continue or begin to network and connect with other creators like yourself. From artists, to writers, to editors, to sensitivity readers, there is a literal smorgasbord of places where you can get help, where you can learn. Be friendly, be kind, and be smart when you're in there. Last thing you want to do is get into a server or get into an anthology project and it's your first time and start burning bridges. I've seen it happen. It's not pretty and it costs what could have been really good writers to have a very lonely and isolated life or it just kind of shows that you might be an asshole so anthologies are really great uh join big writing products like through the veil uncaged and the blood ties anthology the blood ties anthology was actually technically the first writing project i had signed up for uh created by my friend uh darren kinney and it was this collection of 12 new adventures for DD all themed around blood uh, and that kind of thing. And so that was the first anthology I ever got to be part of. And it was really, really cool. There's a lot that happened with that project. And I learned a lot. So. We're going to stop here for our first break. Like I said, you know, five, six, eight minutes will break. Then we'll come back. And that is what. Uh, we'll start in the next part of writing your first product, writing your first product. So see you guys in a little bit and take a break, get some water, that kind of thing. We'll see you in a few.
Hey everyone, welcome back. So we're gonna go over the next two sections of uh, what I got here for this panel. And then we'll take another break and then we'll come back for the end. So what we talked about before the little break is how to get started. What do you need to get started in this industry to build up, you know, kind of the, the little following or to get where you need to go to actually get started on this. So here's the next part we're going to talk about. And that is now actually writing your first project. Oops. And no, I want to start from here. Next slide. So writing your first project. This is actually what we're going to get into of like, what do you need to write your first project? This connects to one of our steps we were talking about number in uh, the first part, step number three. Build around something familiar. This goes back to that niche part. Nine times out of 10, go with something comfortable that you are used to. For me, it was Warlock Patrons. When I got started on the guild back in October of 2019, uh, we, I had done Voices of, Voices of the Gods, and that was really based in history, sort of using the Enochian system. You know, it, For those of you that don't know what Enochian is, it was this whole thing that uh, it was believed that Dr. Dr. John D, who is the uh, head everything pretty much for Queen Elizabeth, uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth I in Shakespearean times, believed that he was able to converse with the angels through this language. So he had written down this alphabet, and I had this little book on Enochian magic. And so I decided to build subclasses around it and to build that Enochian glyph system in to kind of add to it, to build to it. So from there, I was like, well, it's almost Halloween. I really like warlocks. So I decided to create a couple warlocks. So you see the Dark Rider, the Drowned, Kamzots, or, or rather the Great Bat. Uh, and there's one of that I didn't put on there, Baba Yaga. And that was kind of what folks started to know me as. They knew, one, my stuff has really good art. I go and find the best artists that I can to build awesome products from. So there was that bit. And I liked warlocks. I made very heavily flavor-based warlocks. Play to your strengths to show what you can do right off the bat. If people know, and this is all about also building your brand, if people know, hey, I can go to that person, I can get some bomb-ass warlock patrons, or I can go to that person, and I can get some bomb-ass one-shots. That's where you can start. That's where you can build from. But it's important to not pigeonhole yourself because as, while it can be good to market yourself that way, if I only stuck with Warlock patrons, people were probably going to get very bored of me very quick. They were going to be like, yeah, if all he can do is Warlock patrons, then what's the point? I can go and get Warlock patrons from, you know, somebody else that's doing them when, you know, sure, cams are great, but that's all he does. He doesn't show any difference. He doesn't show any ability to change or adapt. So we're thinking about this. What do you want your first product to be? You have your brand. You've got a fun logo for the inside of the book cover because if you're if we're starting on the guild, you cannot put your own logo on the front of the cover. It has to be the Dungeon Masters Guild logo. There's a ton of awesome resources out there about how to get started on the guild, and we'll go into it a little bit more later on. But if you're starting in the guild, which is where I started, the guild logo has to be on the front. You cannot have any others. And then, so what are you going to write? What are you going to write? Step two, find an editor. Editors will save you. I used to never get editors. I was like, I, was, I worked at the writing center at my college. I know what editing is. No problem. However, one of my perks as well as one of my downfalls is I don't know how to balance stuff well. I'm not a balanced guy. I'm not mechanically that great. I can give you super sweet lore. I can give you super sweet flavor, give you some really cool abilities. Chances are, 9% of the time, they are incredibly, incredibly overpowered. So we writers like to think we can spot everything ourselves. Hate to bring it to you, but we cannot. Editors are God sense. They may be critical, but they're the only there to help you and assist you. 
nine times out of 10, my products become way better because of editors. And I really didn't get how important it was having an editor until we did Supers and Sorcery. When I was like, you know, this is a 216 page book. We need some editors on it. And luckily, you know, we were able to find some really awesome ones on the team um, and just really, really good work. So editors, very important. Find an artist. I love artists. I, so many of the artists I find for projects now are really good friends of mine. If I need something really quick, I can usually get them up, uh, like a hold of them and be like, hey, can I use, can I get this? Can I do this? If not, you know, can you point me to someone who, who can? And that's great. That is awesome. Take advantage of that. Now, on the guild and drive through and other resources like Adobe Stock, yes, there are stock art packs. Drive through uh, DMs Guild ones, there are base packs of old wizards art that you gain access to by publishing on the guild. So you, you know, you get them, it's great. They work in a pinch. You find a good piece, huck it on there. However, the downsides are they're often really low quality. A lot of them are not really well, res they don't have good resolution. They don't translate well into PNGs. They really struggle to work well. Yes, you can throw them in there and it'll fix the problem if you just need some like quick filler art, but they often don't have quite the right feel. They often do not work. Now, I know some folks that make awesome projects just from stock art, but usually they go the extra mile and they set up an Adobe stock account and they'll be able to get access to art images. So if you decide, hey, I don't like anything that's on the Guild or drive through I'm gonna go look into Adobe. Adobe stock is $29.99 a month. You get access to 10 free assets a month that will stack if you don't use them. We discovered using that for during Supers and Sorcery was huge. It really helped. We've been using it a ton for comments and cockpits. So if you feel like dropping that extra money, which is again, $30 a month is no small charge to get access to Adobe stock art. There's great stock art on there too. However, there are tons of artists out there who are willing to work with you if you chat with them and it allows you to build a relationship. Like I said, most artists I've worked with are now my friends. And it's awesome having that side. Plus, you get to see how they grow and develop as artists. You bring more people into the hobby. You help make people's dreams come true. Even if it's indie or homebrew, you are still making their dream happen. One of my biggest thoughts here is don't stick to just one style of art. If you say, okay, I want all my projects to look painterly. I want them to look like wizards, core books. Here's the problem though. One, it's going to get boring real quick because everyone's going to think, oh, they only have this one style. And yes, good art can get very boring very quick. Two, that's going to be as expensive as hell. You are going to spend so much more money trying to afford really like big painterly artists that it's going to be kind of a nightmare. Now, there are ways to work around that. We can talk about that a little bit later in, this, in the uh, second part. My books often showcase a ton of styles. I like to show off different styles. I like to use my books as ways to showcase different artists. Uh, on my website, I have a whole page dedicated to just the artists of every single one of my projects I've worked on. Everybody is linked there. Everyone is linked there so that you can go and see and say, whoa, I really like that. I might want to use them or hey, I want to follow them. Use your projects as a chance to showcase what artists can do. That includes cartographers. It includes the graphic designers you may have, which we're going to talk about next. But really, 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 that is a huge opportunity that you have to build and expand and showcase artists. Have fun with it and make your book fun and exciting and vibrant. This is, you know, you've, I'm sure many of you heard the saying of like, oh, the cover doesn't sell the book. In this industry, yes, it does. I have seen some projects that are great mechanically and have really fun gameplay mechanics, but because they spent all their cover on like maps or little stuff on the inside, like all their money on that, they don't have a cover to pull people in. They don't have art to pull people in. So that is 
Find a layout or graphic design artist. Layout and graphic design makes the product go around. Give it, it gives it a professional and high quality tone. There is not a day that goes by, and I had to unfortunately stop reviewing stuff off of Guild because just with being a teacher, it takes up a lot of time that I didn't have. But there will be many times when I get products, and I'd be sitting here looking through them, looking through them. You know, I'm screaming through them. I'm like, oh, okay, I got this one. I'm like, holy cow. The difference of a good layout and graphic design artist on your book is immense. It is immense because it can make your book go from make it or break it. It can make your book go from boom to pow. They will change the very conception of how your book is perceived and how it looks, and it will make it boom. If you'd rather do it yourself, there's an awesome resource from Laura uh, Hisburner that actually allows you to build amazing layout projects in Microsoft Word. So the, pan the uh, template itself is, um, I believe it's $4.99, $4.99 about that on uh, DMs Guild. You get it. It comes with all the files built into a Microsoft Word doc with all the correct formatting, graphs, tables, stat blocks, whole dealio. That is a great way to get a feel for doing layout yourself if you don't feel like you really need a layout or graphic design artist. Luckily, again, this is an area where if you find a good layout or design artist, you can become friends and then you just be like, hey, I got this project. Can you get to it and get to it? And they're like, sure, awesome, can do, will do. So this is a great opportunity that you have access that you could use. So now it's time to publish. Now it's time to publish. One, royalties are your friend. This is the easiest way to pay back collaborators using the royalty tool or the manage royalties. As you'll see over here, I've got some examples of what those look like on DMs go to drive through RPG. Now it differs based on where you go. Drive through RPG takes 35% royalties as payment for a non-exclusive agreement, meaning that anytime your product sells, they're getting 35% of the profits. Drive through uh, RPG then also takes 25% for an exclusive agreement. So not exclusive exclusive means you can sell your book on any other platform as well. Exclusive means your book is exclusively a drive through title. You cannot sell it anywhere else. Now, if we go to the Dungeon Masters Guild, they take 50%, but the upsides are you can use all 5e Wizards IP. You get access to all of that to use in your books. You can build stuff in the official settings, use the official races, use the official classes, but you cannot sell any of your guild content anywhere else. And any guild content is therefore also property of wizards by default. So you give up a lot by publishing stuff on the guild. And that's why for me, I'm slowly trying to scooch more doing through on, more on drive through, but you gain amazing access to high quality content and some stuff that is better than anything Wizards puts out. You got your manage royalties tab, which you use to share royalties around. Some folks might prefer royalties. You know, they might say, hey, out of this, I'll take 5% royalties. So every pay, every book purchase, they make 5%. Some might prefer commission. Some folks are gonna be like, no, you need to pay me up front. I make this flat rate. You can negotiate, you can discuss, but some folks might only be able to do commission. And then some folks might be willing to do a combination of both. For instance, I have a cartographer on a project I'm doing with Realm Warp Media. She's willing to take $100 and then the rest of it in uh, royalty money to pay for some maps we're having her do. So that's kind of an example. But always be upfront about royalties and always be upfront about how much you're going to be making depending on the site you go to. Scheduling releases is good. The new releases wheel can go quick sometimes. If you use the release date tool when publishing your titles down at the very bottom of the, of the publishing page, there's a release date and then set it. That can really help you because unless you schedule something, it's going to disappear quickly. You're going to lose out on advertising time, especially the DMs Guild new releases wheel it can go by so quick because folks might drop tons and tons of products all in one day 
So that's why you use your release date tool. So scheduling releases is good, but so is being spontaneous. <laughs> Sometimes launching stuff just right off the cuff can be good. If it's something small, goofy and fun can be a good idea. It might jazz up a stagnant new releases wheel. Say the new releases wheel hasn't launched in a couple of days or hasn't changed in a couple of days. Then you can release something and be like, hey, I'm changing it up. We're gonna get something going. Or it can also excite the followers and fans you've accrued. They see your stuff like, oh, sweet. You know, uh, so-and-so launched a new project. I can get excited about that. That's super cool. Woo, awesome. You agree, Greta? She agrees. At the end of the day, do what you want to do. And I'll, I'll share a small story about this. I had released a book called Barrow Bound. It was a one-shot. And I don't really write a lot of ventures. There's just too much there for me to be able to handle and plan well. So I'd written this adventure. And I was like, well, I wasn't quite happy with how the layout was last time because I had done it all myself. I had some really cool art that I didn't really showcase well enough. So I went to a buddy of mine, uh, Brian Holmes. And I was like, hey, Brian, would you be willing to do layout? I know you said you were experimenting. Would you be willing to try out some layout for this new version of the book? And he goes, sure. So he finishes it like two weeks later. I go, well, I was planning to do this tomorrow. I'm just really excited about it. And he goes, dude, you released so much stuff. No one's going to be surprised if you drop it today. No one's going to be surprised. They're just going to be like, oh, can't drop something new. And I did. I literally set it up, dropped it that afternoon. Boom, we were done. So if it's on your brand, just like launch stuff, awesome. But if it's on your brand to schedule, have planned releases, make sure to keep that in mind. Biggest thing, guys, be civil and be kind. There are lots of gatekeeping neckbeards and trogs that really like to sully the hobby, especially after the last couple of years. You know, people trying to legitimize racism and classism and uh, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, all that kind of stuff in RPGs. When we go to RPGs to escape from that kind of stuff, we go to RPGs to have everyone be accepted, to have everyone be welcome. And by bringing your gatekeeping and bigotry into the hobby, only people you're really hurting is, the or A, the minorities you're being a bigot towards, but also yourself, because no one's going to want to play with you. No one's going to want to create with you. So those of you guys that are dealing with those, which I myself have, best model is to kill them with kindness. When folks leave negative reviews or negative discussion questions on your product page, just be polite, you know, oh, be surprise them because they're going to expect you to fire back. And it's pretty basic. We all know that people who tend to do stuff like that want a response. It's what fuels them. So be polite, friendly, and concise, and they're not going to know how to handle it. Just respond once, leave it alone. Unless it becomes a really big issue, leave it alone. Fighting with people on the internet will 99% of the time not work out for anyone. It's going to leave everyone angry, everyone frustrated, everyone annoyed. <laughs> just ignore them. It's not worth the time. You know, if they're just being a douche, then just ignore them. If it's getting dangerous, you report them. It's that simple. There's a block and a report button on Twitter. There's a block and a report button in Discord. Cultivate a healthy, welcoming, inclusive community, folks. Literally the core of it all. No matter what edition of D&D you play, no matter what kind of RPGs you play if you don't play D&D, no matter, just be kind and be civil. So, keeping the steam going. What do you do now that you're done? How do you keep it going? How do you keep it going? So first, make sure it's always fun. And this has been a big one for me recently, especially because I've been working as a teacher full-time. The minute... The minute, not the, not the month, not the day, not the week, the minute that you are not having fun writing, you need to step back and reassess. At the end of the day, I hate to break it to you guys, you are not going to make a ton of money off of being in this industry. There are folks that blow up. There are folks that make tons off of it. For me, this is about having fun, writing with my friends, and having a creative venue to let some stress out after a long day at work. I can come home, 
flip discord on, see what people are working on, see what my writer friends are working on, see what my writers are working on. And then we can go from there. You can build and just come back. It's having a way to get some time away from all the craziness in the world. And especially after what we've been experiencing through COVID, through the, you know, all this, uh, the racial uh, protests, all the, re the rebuilding, the reformation of, you know, the government here in the U.S., you know, stuff going on in Europe, Brexit, all that kind of thing. We've had a lot of craziness going on the last couple months, last year or so, last couple years. And writing is an, is an escape from that. But the very instant you are not enjoying yourself anymore, that's a red flag. That's when you need to stop. And this goes perfectly into two. Take breaks. Take breaks, guys. Take breaks. It is important in any endeavor. I'm still working on get, getting better at this. I really sometimes, you know, will not know where the line is of, oh, I gotta get this done. Gotta get this done. Gotta get this done. That's not what success is. Getting something done on time and released on time, if you look at any video game company, is not how it works. Releasing later, but with better content is always good. Burnout is very, very real. As an educator and a game designer, I experience that a lot. And burnout can kill you. Stress can kill you. This industry is friggin' stressful. You've got Kickstarters. You've got fans. You've got printing. You've got artists. There's so many things. There are days where I'd rather be in the classroom than managing something that I really love. So give yourself time for some brain space. Maybe take a break for a couple weeks. Take a break for a couple months. You owe it to yourself not to work 24-7, 365. You owe it to yourself to make good content, but you also owe it to yourself to not die from burnout. So take breaks. Post often and be you. This goes back to our very first thing of get on social media. Whether it be on social media or in your work, be authentic and always be posting. Not just a bot spamming your products. Not just a bot spamming your products. Don't just always constantly be like, oh, it's self-promo Saturday. Oh, it's it's uh, Whip Wednesday. It's uh, TTRPG Solidarity Thursday. Don't just always post during that. Interact. This connects with networking. Share thoughts. Post articles. Support and boost other creators. Participate in threads and discussions. That's half the fun of building a community is that you can network. You can meet folks. You can, you can enjoy the company of folks. These are all good ways to get yourself out there and find your fellow people. This goes into what I was talking about, about collaboration. Excuse me, networking. That's all part of it. This space is a welcoming one. We are inclusive. We are diverse. You need to respect that. If you go on social media and start being a freaking bigot and start, you know, making an ass of yourself, bending over and showing us your whole ass, that's a line crossed. You will be called out for it and shown the door. We don't have room for bigots, people who are disrespectful, people who are not welcoming to diversity. We don't have space for that in this community because if you think about it, all of us started off as people who were ridiculed. This whole industry, the whole community, we were made fun of. And now we're gatekeeping from our own community where we sought for refuge. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. So make sure that you are always, always being welcoming. But if you see someone who is, who is dangerous to that, who is not, that's when you're going to show them the door. Collaborate, collaborate, guys. I cannot stress this enough. I've said it a couple of times throughout this panel already. Collaboration is the key to a good time and growth. Participate in threads and apply to anthology books. Already covered on that. Partner up with a couple of other writers you know well. Once you form your community, once you form your friends, then you can collab, collab, collab. You can build and build and build. 
there are folks always looking for people to join series or bigger quest books and the like. So keep an eye out. But this also was something that I've really been encouraging more folks recently to do so. And that's to play lots of other RPGs too. Collaborative play in other systems will make you a better writer and developer. Whether you're writing for 5e, Pathfinder, uh, Call of Cthulhu, Quest, anything. The more games you play, the better at gaming you're going to be. You don't just play one brand of video game. If you do, then I highly recommend you switch that up because that's going to get boring real quick. I used to only play 5e. I used to only play D&D. Then I discovered stuff like City of Mist, Vason, uh, Pathfinder 2e, Honey Heist, Witcher. All games I have on this slide, and they have made me a better writer. They have made me a better designer because I can see how other games have done it, and I can borrow bits and pieces. So really, really play lots of other RPGs. Play lots of other RPGs. So we're going to pause there. We're going to take another break. That's a lot all of a sudden to throw at you guys. So we're going to stop here. We're going to do another five-minute break, and then we'll come back to talk about the move to Kickstarter and how to do that successfully. So we'll see you guys in a few.
So, hey everyone, we are back now for the final part of the panel. I know it's been a lot and there's been a lot of information getting hucked at you, but hopefully this will help you learn and develop more as you want to take your love of RPGs to the next step. So now the big piece, and I've often been asked this by a lot of my friends, and this panel is a perfect opportunity to kind of nail it down and kind of uh, figure out why. And it, there's a couple of stories that goes along with this. So let me get our next portion of the presentation up. And there we go. So moving to Kickstarter. So the story of how we got to Kickstarter is that obviously COVID happened. I was home finishing up my uh, spring year of student teaching. Uh, so I finished all my student teaching online. And a couple of friends of mine were talking about in the DMs Guild creative server, uh, how would you do like costume vigilantes in 5e and so me being the very outspoken nerd i am i was pinged and i was like huh what where am i required where where do you need me huh and so about 20 minutes later i made a server and about 20 minutes after that we started getting people in and then our first project supers and sorcery happened which we'll get more to in a minute supers and sorcery was really uh you know, was sort of a learning curve. But before I get more into them, I want to go over what I've come to find in doing our two Kickstarters has really shown. Like, I, I kind of want to talk about what, what I've learned from them, and then we'll go into how that, how these four Cs affect them. So first, you have color, character, communication, and consistency. These are the four Cs of Kickstarter. I've reviewed a ton of Kickstarters, I've talked to a bunch of folks who've run Kickstarters, and I've run two now. Color, you want bright, exciting pages. Tell stories through images and visuals, not through text. If your Kickstarter has a lot of text, people are gonna peter out real quick because they don't wanna read that. They wanna see, what am I gonna get? What are your add-ons? What are your stretch goals? Does this look bright? Does this look exciting? That's what they wanna see. Character, be friendly, be happy, be cordial, be open, be honest. If you're a dick, no one wants to support your Kickstarter if you're a dick. Plain and simple. If you're an ass, no one wants to talk to you. No one wants to support you. If you are friendly, if you're open, if you're willing to talk to anyone, respond to questions, respond to messages, try to help people, try to talk to them, that is what's going to make people see, hey, those pe are good people. They make good Kickstarters, and they actually talk to people. They actually help people. And that plays perfectly into communication. Get back to people in a reasonable time, be open, and be willing to take critique. I have run into so many Kickstarters that I've wanted to review, and I've tried to reach out to the creators and said, no, we're not looking for any help. We're fine, thank you. Or I'll be like, hey, maybe you guys might want to fix this. No, we, we know what we're doing. Immediately makes it less likely that I want to work with you. If you're willing to take critique and say, hey, maybe we need to add some more stretch goals, or maybe we need to reorganize the page a little bit. That also goes into sharing your Kickstarter page with your team. If you're building a Kickstarter page, 
let them see the preview. That's going to give you more eyes on it that can help you see what's going on. And then consistency. Keep a schedule, keep records, keep in touch, keep well-organized plans. All of that is going to make those other things, those other three, color, character, and communication, way easier. If you keep a schedule, say, okay, keep track of how the Kickstarter is going. Keep track of the buildup to the Kickstarter. What we did with Comets and Cockpits and Supers and Sorcery is that with, with Comets and Cockpits, we gathered the team by November 15th. We finished all of our writing up, our first draft, by January 15th. Then March 15th, we launched the project. And then we wrapped up by April 15th. So keeping that schedule, that consistency, perfect. Keep in touch. Keep in touch with your writers. Keep in touch with your artists. Don't just set the friggin' Kickstarter up and then ignore everyone. That's not how that works. You need to keep your team involved because if they're not involved, your Kickstarter is going to tank because you're not going to have support. You're not going to have your team. You're not going to have advertising. And frankly, at that point, you don't deserve to be a team lead anymore. You need to be consistent. You need to communicate with your team, keep your team in the loop, and communicate with your backers as well. These are the four C's. And I'm going to kind of go into how that played out. So, Supers and Sorcery, spring 2020. Our initial goal was $3,000, uh, mostly for art. We were funded in 10 hours. Our end goal after uh, fees and everything, or our end goal in general before fees was $12,424. We got 557 backers and we've sold almost 360 copies. So we're an Electrum bestseller now. This has all been since December of 2020 when we launched the book. We got we launched the Kickstarter in I believe it was uh, August, and then we had we had it up and ready to go right before Christmas. So we had a pretty tight production schedule. We also had a very small team of twenty people of only like a little over ten people. We had about a team of twelve writers, including myself, my creative partner Adam Hancock, our editors, and our yeah and our editors. So we had a very small team. So that was Supers and Sorcery, and we learned a lot. We learned a lot. One big thing, we didn't make more stretch goals than we needed to. So often, Kickstarters will die if they try to do more than they can. You'll see them adding Kickstarter, uh, stretch goal after stretch goal after stretch goal after stretch goal, and you'll be like, okay. And then it takes you like four years to get your Kickstarter because they have to try and manufacture all the stretch goal stuff. So we said, we're doing these X stretch goals after that, Everything else goes into art, goes into paying the writers more. Straight up. Easy peasy. It wasn't that hard. Now, we'll fast forward. Comments and Cockpits. Spring of 2021. So we figured out what we're doing, we're doing with uh, Supers and Sorcery. It was really awesome. We're like, cool. We're lining up for the next one. Again, that consistency part. Our initial goal, 3,000. I decided all daylight projects are going to start with a goal of 3,000. It is high enough to show that, hey, we mean business, but also means we can hit a lot of stretch goals and potentially make more. We were funded in 100 minutes. 100 minutes compared to our first project. We are ending funds worth $38,565 before fees. We had 996 backers. Double the backers and triple the funds. And we were like flabbergasted, absolutely flabbergasted. Part of this is because we used our pre-launch page as a place to gather folks. We had almost 600 followers on our pre-launch page and we did a ton of advertising. Again, that plays into networking, that plays into being consistent, communicating, posting, building, creating. Kickstarters, boom or flop because they are very much a word of mouth industry. So. Comments and Cockpits, we also learned a lot from because this was a two book project, which I don't think I'm ever going to do again because it's very complicated and there's a lot of frustration and stress. And it, it took, it's taken a lot of time because we're not funding one book, we're funding two. So that's been a lot of stress. But 
Comets and Cockpits we learned a lot from, and I'm hoping that we see more growth in other daylight projects as we go from there. So, best of luck to all of you, and now onwards. I want to wrap it up there. Hopefully you guys have learned a lot from this panel. I hope that this is giving you some insight, some learning, some, you know, has opened your eyes to what it takes to be part of the community, to join, to take that to the next step. All of you that are watching this now are going to have access to a link to join our Discord server so you can participate in our Daylight Publications Mentorship Program where we actually guide you guys through the process of creating and publishing your own subclass or race. Uh, and that is going to be a way to help you enter the industry, to get your foothold in there. Uh, and so you're going to have access to that link to join for Session 3, which will be our fall session. Really excited for that. Uh, and we really just hope that you guys come, you join, you participate, and bring more excitement to the hobby. So, again, guys, thank you to EGX for allowing me to come and give you guys this panel. I really appreciate it. This is a huge passion of mine, and I'm really a massive advocate for getting more folks to join in the industry. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys taking the time to stop in, listen into this, and uh, I hope we see you in the server and we see more folks join the hobby. So... May all your rolls be 20s, and I hope to see you on the Guild or on drive-thru. Thanks. <laughs>